Welcome back, Brad. We've not seen you since you became a dad, so congratulations. Uh, I don't have anything at the top, so we can go to you first, and I'm going to bet what's on your mind. Uh, there's a few things. On my okay. Mind, but we'll start with Iran. Okay. Um, <coughs> Mm -hmm. um, well, let me say first, um, as I think many of you are aware, uh, the Secretary will be very engaged in uh, meeting with and speaking with his former colleagues uh, about this issue. Um, he spoke with Senator Menendez yesterday, uh, but he'll be uh, doing a, a number of calls over the coming days with, with the respect for the fact that many people are spending time with their family, uh, families for Thanksgiving. Uh, also, and I just didn't want to forget to add this. Uh, we're also uh, going to send a video uh, to all members of Congress uh, this afternoon, uh, which is the Secretary outlining for them in very basic terms what the Iran agreement does uh, and what it doesn't do. Uh, he certainly understands that this will be a vigorous debate, though he believes that uh, everything doesn't have to be a showdown. Uh, and the video is part of our effort uh, to make sure that the debate is based on facts uh, and not uh, not rumor or, uh, or uh, otherwise. Uh, in terms of specific, and I know there's a range of pieces of legislation, including the one uh, you uh, mentioned, uh, passing any uh, new sanctions uh, legislation during the course of the negotiations, uh, in our view, would be unhelpful uh, and can put the, could put the success uh, of the outcome at risk. Uh, that is certainly a message the Secretary will be conveying. Uh, and I think you've heard uh, that message coming from our colleagues over in the White House as well. Uh, and as he portrays this, or conveys this, I should say, to his former colleagues, uh, there are a couple of reasons. Uh, one is um, it could divide uh, the P5 plus one because other countries would think that the United States is not living up to our end of the bargain in terms of giving the negotiations a chance. Uh, and it could have uh, the opposite in impact of what is intended uh, by driving the Iranians to take a harder line in the needs negotiations and response. Uh, second, uh, and this is a very important one, especially for the supporters of sanctions, which the Secretary is a big proponent of sanctions and how effective they are, uh, we already have the leverage of additional sanctions in place. Uh, if the Iranians violate the agreement during the six months, we'd move to, uh, we'd support moving to additional sanctions. We'd be leading the charge. Um, if the Iranians don't get to a yes at the end of six months, we can put in place more sanctions. So the question here is what is in the spirit of the negotiations uh, and what would be most effective as we work towards uh, a comprehensive agreement. And, and third, um, the Iranians could also seek to exploit divisions in the international community to unravel the international uh, sanctions sanction regi regime. Uh, as you know, uh, because we negotiated with the P5 plus one, this isn't just about one country's impact, it's about all of the country's impact. Uh, it isn't the U.S. trade embargo alone. Uh, it's our, also our ability to get other countries to reduce their purchases of Iranian oil, uh, to cut Iran off from uh, the international financial system. So there are a range of very important and substantive issues he'll be conveying as to why we should not put in new legislation. Since you mentioned the uh, six-month period, mm -hmm. is it your understanding that that has already begun, or is that subject to a start time determined by some sort of implementing parameters? Uh, well, that's a good question. Uh, it <coughs> has not uh, – the next step here is – uh, a continuation of technical discussions at a working level so that we can essentially uh, tee up the implementation of the agreement. Uh, so that would involve the P5 plus one, um, a commission of the P5 plus one uh, experts working with the Iranians and the IAEA. Uh, obviously, once that's we, those technical discussions are worked through, uh, I guess the clock would, would start. Uh, obviously, there'll also be a reconvening of the political track. Uh, with the P5 plus one, which under Secretary Sherman will continue to be our lead negotiator on. Just two things with that. How long do you expect that process to take until the clock starts? And secondly, is it your understanding that the Iranians are already implementing the agreement, or are they using this lull for whatever they prefer? Uh, I don't have a specific timeline for you. I'm happy to check and see if there's something more specific in terms of, of how quickly the technical pieces could be outlined or agreed to. Uh, in terms of 
uh, what the Iranians are or aren't doing, you know, obviously our hope would be, given we are respecting the spirit of the agreement uh, in, in pressing for sanctions not to be put in place and beginning the process of figuring out uh, how to uh, deliver on our end of the bargain, that uh, the same would be uh, coming from their end in the spirit of the, of the agreement. Jed, can I ask? Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I haven't got, despite all this paper, I haven't actually got the agreement in front of me. There's a lot of paper. Yeah, there's a lot true. of paper. There's a lot of <laughs> stories around at the moment. Yes. Um, um, it, there's some language in the agreement that talks about that the there will not be any new sanctions imposed during the six-month period. Is it your understanding that if there were to be new sanctions, would that violate the terms of the agreement? Well, certainly um, that was part of, uh, part of what the United States, and we've been very upfront about this, um, that we think should be part of the agreement and is part of the agreement. Uh, in terms of whether it would violate, I mean, I think I just touched on our concern of putting new sanctions in place and how that would, uh, that would you know, violate the spirit of and, and what our agreement is with the Iranians. Well, at the same time, as you know, but it's still worth repeating, uh, the core sanctions regime wouldn't be touched, and those would still be implemented and fully in place, and we're talking about new ones and a small uh, reversible component of others that were agreed to. So it's not entirely clear yet whether there would be a violation of the agreement, and were there to be any new sanctions, either from yourselves or your partners in the EU, for instance? Uh, well, certainly that's part of the spirit of the negotiations so, and the spirit of what we committed to. So um, certainly that would be something that would be of concern. And on the flip side... Um, the foreign minister said that... Uh, sorry. Um, okay. The foreign minister said um, in an interview... Um, foreign yes, Minister Zarif? Zarif. Okay. Sorry, did I say foreign minister? Yes, I did. Um, uh, that if, if new uh, sanctions were imposed, the deal was off. Uh, well, I, I think we've been very clear about, from the United States perspective, as I just outlined, the reasons why we shouldn't put new sanctions in place now, while still continuing to implement those that remain in place. So uh, I don't think there's a, there's a disagreement about how, uh, how uh, unhelpful that would be. Can, can I ask that on the flip side? Mm -hmm. um, the Europeans are now um, going to the EU uh, as a whole to talk about how they're going to try and do mm -hmm. some of this sanctions relief that was offered in the, in the deal. When, on the American side, can we see some of that sanctions relief um, being implemented? And how will it come? In what form will, mm -hmm. what, what form will it take? Um, well, there will obviously be technical discussions, and, and that discussion will be ongoing. I don't have an exact timeline in terms of when each piece, but it's also not a all-at-one-time or a... Uh, you know, a spigot that's turned all the way on. So it would be a slow process that obviously we control, and some of those details are still being worked out. Just in terms of logistics, we're mm -hmm. talking about executive orders. Uh, I would assume there's no congressional uh, approval that's, that's necessary. Would there be notification? Um, things like that. Uh, that's a really good question <laughs> in terms of the t technical tick-tock of how it would work. I just have to check with our team and see what the specific next steps would be on and that front. Just before we, we move, we move sure. on, I just have a couple um, elements of the agreement that mm -hmm. I wanted to ask you about. Mm -hmm. There's been some concern, one, about the heavy water reactor at Arak, mm -hmm. that there wouldn't actually be live monitoring. There would only be uh, the cameras that would be installed would then take footage and then the next day you would pick up yesterday's footage. Uh, why was that agreed to? Are you worried about what that might mean? I, I'd honestly have to check on that level of specificity for you, Brad. I mean, obviously, um, you know, what we're looking at here is these are the first meaningful limits, as you know, Iran has agreed to. And the, uh, the level of monitoring is unprecedented in this case. So uh, I'm happy to check and see the specifics of, of how that would actually take place. And then just one more. Um, mm -hmm. The agreement talked about a joint monitoring commission, mm -hmm. uh, the EU three, uh, P5 plus mm -hmm. one, mm -hmm. and Iran. Does having Iran in that joint monitoring commission create problems in terms of um, enforcement or, you know, really holding them up to the standards if they are themselves kind of in charge as well of, of, you know, enforcing their own commitments? Well, there are many parties in charge. Obviously, you need the cooperation of Iran in order to fully implement. Um, they've agreed to uh, this first step, which was announced this weekend. And as I've mentioned, if there's a violation of that, 
uh, we would reconsider what our commitments are as well. But remember, there are there is a commission, mm -hmm. there are a number of countries involved, and we're going to be monitoring and watching very closely. Right, but how how realistic is it that this commission would announce violations if Iran is on the commission? Wouldn't Iran say, no, we're not violating it? Very few countries ever announce that they're violating their own agreements. Uh, I'm not aware of there being, but I'm happy to check, an yeah. individual veto by one country of whether there are violations. But uh, there, there will be a commission, as you mentioned, that will be uh, closely monitoring uh, whether there are violations that take place. And every country who's engaged in this, uh, the P5 plus one, has a high stake in making sure that we're, we're monitoring closely what's happening on the ground. So you, just to, to close the, the knot, you have no concerns about the autonomy and the, the power of this commission to kind of put forth violations should they occur? Uh, we feel that, um, you know, this is, uh, these are the first meaningful limits Iran has committed to. These, this is a, uh, the strongest monitoring capability we've ever had, and uh, we'll obviously be watching closely if, if there are violations that, uh, that are raised. Jen, uh, can I ask about Robert Levinson? Sure. Uh, we saw a statement from the White House um, today respectfully asking Iran to help us locate him and um, ensure his safety. And I just wanted to ask, was he, did, did he come up as part of the nuclear negotiations or any of these talks we've been having with Iran over the last year? Um, well, uh, let me first reiterate, I know the White House put out a statement, but certainly this is an issue that uh, many in this building are, of course, very committed to. Um, as uh, was noted in the statement, um, uh, on March 9, 2007, um, Robert Levinson went missing uh, during a business trip. Um, today he becomes one of the longest held Americans in history. Um, as we approach uh, the upcoming holiday season, uh, we also want to reiterate the commitment of uh, the State Department, the United States government, to locating Mr. Levinson and bringing him home safely to his family, friends, and loved ones. Uh, the P5 plus 1 talks uh, focused uh, exclusively on nuclear issues, but we have raised, um, repeatedly uh, raised his case um, in, in the cases of other detained American citizens, including Amir Hekmati and Sayyid Abedini in our bilateral discussions with Iran, including uh, President Obama's phone call with President Rouhani in September, uh, so as recently as then, and we will uh, continue to do so. So it didn't come up in Geneva? Um, it was... Uh, the focus of that of the meetings in Geneva were on the nuclear negotiations. And just one more thing on that: what's what's the latest that we know about his location, condition, anything? What's the latest the U.S. government knows about him? I don't have any uh, specific update for you uh, that I can provide. Obviously, this is an issue that we remain committed to, um, and obvious and it and and having a moment like today where we're uh, acknowledging that he he has been detained now or missing, I should say, for longer than any other U.S. citizen reminds us of, uh, you know, how much his family has been thinking about it, and reminds us of you know how much we'd like to see him returned home. Sure. Um, did you get any indication from the Iranians that, one, they knew where he was, mm -hmm. and two, they could have any impact on bringing him out from wherever he is? I just don't have any update I can, I can provide on that front. So oh, no, Ron? Oh, sorry. Let's, we'll go to you next, Alec. Go ahead. Um, so since you made the statement welcoming the announcement of Geneva II, mm -hmm. uh, the Iranian foreign minister said they, are, they will be happy to participate without any conditions. I know you don't issue the invitations, mm -hmm. but would you think that Iran participation in Geneva II will be helpful? Uh, our position on this uh, has not changed. Uh, as you know, no decisions have yet been made about which countries will be participating in Geneva II. Uh, as I also noted, the P5 plus 1 uh, talks focused on, solely on the uh, nu on Iran's nuclear program, uh, which is of course a very separate issue. Uh, but our position hasn't changed. Um, the goal of Geneva II is the full Im implementation of the Geneva Communique. So all participants must have accepted and endorsed it. Uh, that is not something that Iran has done. Uh, if they did take that step, we would evaluate. But uh, that's not a step that they have taken at this time. What would you interpret his position that w without any conditions? has basically lifting any veto on Assad being uh, representing the delegation. I, I don't know what his, uh, what the intention or meaning of that. I'd, I'd point you to them to answer that question. But what we know is they have not uh, endorsed the Geneva Communique, uh, which is, of course, the purpose of a Geneva II conference. So uh, therefore, our position has not changed. The opposition hasn't endorsed the Geneva Communique, and you plan on inviting them. 
So I, I don't quite understand why that has to I'd be. hardly put Iran and the Syrian opposition in the same category. Well, they're uh, both players in this conflict. What, you know, judgment aside on, on who is at fault or who you think is better or worse, um, they, they both have a role to play in any Well, uh, and I disagree with that. I know that there have been a range <coughs> of comments made by the opposition over the last several months, though they have agreed to attend. Uh, we Their next step for them is, of course, working to uh, put together a representative delegation to uh, join the conference. Uh, I think there is agreement that the goal here is to create a transitional government uh, through mutual consent. Um, we've been clear that there can be no uh, preconditions uh, that they, uh, and they have made statements on that, and that has been our clear response uh, to that as well. Uh, do we have, well, yeah. let's just finish Iran first and then we can go. Are there more on Iran? Yeah. On Iran. On, <coughs> let's go to Iran and then we'll go to you next, Samir, if that's Agreement with Iran has a position on Iran Pakistan <coughs> gas pipeline changed. You were opposed to it because of the sanctions. Now you're relaxing sanctions, so has a position on that? Has change? not changed. Um, just as a reminder, uh, there is very limited reversible relief that's a part of the first step. Uh, that does not impact the core sanctions regime. So our pol our position on that has not changed. Do we have any more in Iran? Okay, go ahead in the back, and we'll go to you next, Jeff. Regarding the this inspection and the, the nuclear program part, and in the same time there is this lifting of the sanctions, are these related to each other or parallel to each other or it's done uh, one after the other? I'm not sure. I I'm, I'm trying to explain again. Mm -hmm. When you say it has two parts in the agreement, one of them is, let's say, the inspection and the nuclear program. And as a reward That's or That's like, not a one-time thing. Uh, we're I talking know. about daily access. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, but in relation to that, it was mentioned the lifting of the sanctions. Are there, this time-wise, are they related to each other when they are going to start? Well, I, and Brad asked a sort of similar question in, in that what is the next step here? So there are going to be technical discussions at a working level um, to, to essentially tee up implementation. There are pieces agreed to by both sides. You referenced... Uh, some reversible uh, limited sanctions relief. Um, there's also, on the other side, uh, a, and a commitment to, uh, to uh, uh, daily access for inspections. Uh, so the timing of those, I don't have a prediction of yet, but obviously that's what we're working so, but towards. But this is one side. At the other side was, I mean, the, op I mean, the parallel side is the lifting of the sanctions. I mean, is when it's going to happen, lifting of the sanctions, at the beginning or the end of this process? Uh, it's not either one of those. It's a process where there would be some, it would be a progression. So um, that's that's what we're working through as well. And there was a number mentioned, which is either between four to seven billion dollars. Is this over the six months or one month or what is it? It's it's not one month. It's it's what it's it's the total, and it applies to all of the relief internationally. So, um, you know, there'd be a progressive process over the course of the first step. The technical discussions where are they likely to be held in Geneva or Vienna? I'd have to check on that specifically for you. That's just the next step. In and that won't involve Wendy Sherman. That's at a, just That's, at a technical level. Right, exactly, exactly. And then f from this progression of the sanctions relief, mm -hmm. is it more like an installment phase? Are they going to do it by installments? Is that the idea? Uh, I that's more accurate than saying it would. It's all. It's all at, at once. But uh, in terms of how it would happen, I mean, obviously that's still being uh, worked through, and and we have a big controlling factor as it relates to our sanctions in terms of how it would work, and it would be uh, more like a slow progression. And, and you don't know which bit would come first, whether it be the freezing up the capital, or the gold and precious metals, or the auto industry, or the oil. Some of that is still being worked through, um, so I don't have any update on it at this particular moment. Is, is there any kind of timeline within that? I mean, I understand you have to have your t technical discussions first, but mm -hmm. if I imagine that the Iranians are looking for something fairly swiftly to be coming from you, otherwise they're going to start getting a bit cross that they'll feel that the, their, the bargain's not being kept up. So have you sort of told them we're, we're looking to do this sometime in December, I know that's what's being projected by the EU side of things. Well, certainly there's an awareness of the technical piece of this that needs to happen. So we're engaged in that closely, as are other countries. And 
uh, you know, as as soon as, as that's uh, worked through, then then we'll be able to start moving forward. Iran. Iran. Mm -hmm. Just one more quick question sure. on uh, the country Turkey who hosted these uh, talks in the past, uh, P five plus one and mm -hmm. Iran talks. Uh, is there any role uh, Turkey is playing right now in terms of these talks or facilitating or are you, uh, do you have any expectations from Turkey on this? In terms juncture? of hosting talks or? Uh, hosting talks or uh, in general uh, during these talks and negotiations? Uh, I, I, I'm sure that the Secretary and others will be in touch with Foreign Minister Davutoglu about uh, how uh, about this process and where we landed. I don't have any other prediction beyond that. Uh, uh, do you well, not like Geneva? Uh, let me do follow up just okay. one quick again. Uh, Israel and Saudis are the two allies that have been discussed mm -hmm. a lot in terms of this deal, a uh, nuclear deal. Uh, another discussion is going on in Turkey. How do you think your uh, ally in Turkey being uh, affected by, by this uh, Iranian deal? Uh, I'd, I'd point you to Turkey on that to, to outline it. Obviously, this is something that P5 plus 1 has committed to. Uh, there are other countries that uh, may decide to follow suit, but I don't have any prediction for you in terms of the specific impact on Turkey. Can you share with us any phone calls that the Secretary made to uh, the Saudi Foreign Minister or anybody in the Gulf? Sure. Um, he spoke yesterday with uh, Crown Prince Mohammed bin Zayed. He also spoke with uh, with uh, UA Foreign Minister Abdullah bin Zayed, and he spoke with uh, Foreign Minister Saud al Faisal yesterday as well. Um, he'll be uh, uh, speaking with a range of foreign ministers, of course, over, over the coming days to brief them on the outcome of the negotiations and the specifics, and, and of course, discuss where we go from here. Just on the timing, do you know if the call came before they made an announcement to welcome the deal, or was it after? Uh, I, I don't have that exact tick tock of timing for you. Oh, let's Can we go here. Afghanistan? Uh, uh, let's fin yeah, let's finish uh, Iran. Just a technical question. Sure. It's about the Alak uh, heavy water reactor. You know, mm -hmm. the agreement didn't say uh, doesn't say that stop uh, constructing, but you know, he, he just say uh, that just say uh, stop installing reactor or fuel or something. That means the same things uh, stop constructing. Uh, well, uh, there's, this is a first step, so just that's an important reminder here. So obviously um, Iran's ability to produce weapons-grade plutonium using the Iraq re reactor was what our bar was here. And there were a number of steps included in the agreement, which you can read online, of course, that do address that, that were of vital importance to the United States. Um, and beyond that, there obviously will be an ongoing discussion as, as we pursue the, the coming months and, and uh, lead to a comprehensive, as we lead to a comprehensive agreement. Um, Any more in Iran? Yes, just, uh, okay. The secretary visit to Israel, is it decided or not yet? I think he said um, we're still working through the final details of the schedule, but that he'd like to go soon after uh, Thanksgiving. So uh, that remains our plan. There it was reported from Israel that I think is uh, Prime Minister, National Security Advisor is going to visit. The Come town. to the United States yes. uh, in a delegation. Yes, yeah. that's correct. Mm -hmm. And it's it's decided when. Uh, I believe it's sometime early next month. I don't I don't know that there's a date uh, that's been set yet. Not that I'm aware of. Okay. Sure. Any more in Iran? One more in Iran. Okay. Um, the Boston Globe was reporting today that uh, then Senator Kerry was a part of the talks in Oman. So I wanted to know if you do have any general comment on that. And also, given the uh, time in advance of the P5 plus one talks that occurred, does that give any indication of how, how complicated and challenging this next round of talks is going to be, given that there was so much of a preamble before the P5 plus one talks started? Uh, sure. Well, uh, let me just give you, I know there have been a range of reports over the last couple of days, so let me just give you a, a quick overview uh, for those who are interested. Uh, so Secretary Kerry, when he was Senator and Chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee, um, did travel to Amman uh, in coordination with the White House and with the administration uh, to meet with the Sultan and uh, explore uh, whether uh, Oman uh, could be a channel uh, for engaging uh, with the Iranians. Uh, there, we have long had many channels uh, to communicate bilaterally uh, with the Iranians, uh, including 
uh, exchanges of high-level letters, uh, bilateral discussions in the margins of the P5 plus one, uh, passing messages through the Swiss protecting power in Tehran, passing messages through the UN missions in uh, New York. Uh, and the Omanis, as many of you may remember, uh, helped facilitate the release of hikers, of the hikers uh, as well, several years ago. Uh, so that was a, a trip he took uh, when he was uh, chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee. There also have been, uh, through that same, uh, that same line of communication, uh, meetings uh, in Oman, uh, I know they've been reported, uh, that uh, with the Iranians uh, to, uh, to discuss uh, whether uh, there was a channel for moving forward. These have been uh, closely coordinated or, or we've briefed our P5 plus one partners on those. We've consistently uh, told P5 plus one partners and our Israeli friends uh, that if things developed substantively, we'd of course, uh, it would be fed into the overall process, which is exactly what happened. Uh, so that's just a quick overview, uh, but certainly I can confirm uh, the Secretary's trip there when he was uh, sent uh, to Oman, when he was a senator, uh, and uh, the importance of that as a, as a channel uh, leading up. But one last thing, and then I'll go to you, Chris. Obviously, uh, the election, as we predicted last spring, the election of President Rouhani, uh, the new administration, the exchange of letters with the president, um, the uh, openness to pursuing a channel moving forward was when things really uh, picked up, uh, and, and that's really what led through the P5 plus one process to the agreement this weekend. What was the timeline for this? Uh, said that the Senate, when the, uh, the Secretary was in the Senate. Uh, he went to Oman in December of 2011. Thank you. Just to clarify something, mm -hmm. I'd, I'd seen a report that um, while those talks were happening in Oman that we had not let Israel know. Uh, that we, uh, we did tell and inform. Israel they were we were, they were briefed. Um, uh, we've always told our partners that if uh, that we would be open to bilateral discussions, <laughs> and if anything developed or was serious, we would brief them on those. And the president briefed Prime Minister Netanyahu in September. Uh, can you confirm that the talks in Oman started as far back as March this year? Mm -hmm. So before the election of Rouhani. Yes, and and the determination at that point was uh, was the goal that at that point was determining if there was if there was a, a channel to. Uh, to uh, to work through, uh, but as I mentioned, uh, really the things picked up with uh, with President Rouhani and uh, President Obama exchanging letters. No, I mean before that. One more I in check, Iran? Yeah, okay. uh, yes. I'm just checking something. I read if you confirm it or not. Okay. There was in August a meeting by uh, under uh, Deputy Secretary Burns and Sullivan with uh, Iranian officials before the UN meetings. Well, is this true? Yeah, there were some meetings. They were fed into the P5 plus one process uh, and that, that resulted in the agreement this weekend. Afghanistan? Ready? Yes. The best trip to Afghanistan. You've been saying that the end of this month was not, I, I guess you didn't use the word deadline, but that was the time frame that Karzai needed to sign this or not. Do we have a deadline there? What's the, what's the latest we can wait for him to sign it before we start making plans to pull troops out? Uh, well, uh, the timeline, which you're referencing, is when we signed the SPA last year, uh, we agreed on a year time frame, right, which is this month, November. Uh, so it was both sides agreeing, which is an important component of this. What is absolutely true is that um, <laughs> Uh, in order, uh, in order to uh, to move forward and plan for the United States, for our NATO allies to plan, uh, in order for uh, Afghans to have the certainty they deserve regarding their future in the critical months preceding the elections, uh, in order to uh, prevent uh, uh, nations' pledges of assistance made at Chicago and Tokyo conferences, it's important in our view to do this as quickly as possible. I'm not here to set new deadlines. Uh, but obviously, uh, this is something that could not wait until after the election. Uh, it's something we are prepared to sign and we'd like to sign and move forward on as quickly as possible. And that's what uh, we continue to convey. Do you still want him to sign it before the end of the month? Uh, I, we've never set a specific deadline. That's been the timeline that's been agreed to. We want 
him to sign it as quickly as possible. But how much time does the U.S. need to plan if it's going to withdraw all of its forces? Uh, well, one one thing to be to be absolutely clear on that, uh, I know that. Uh, that um, that uh, that there was a readout that was del that was given uh, about the about Ambassador Rice's trip to Afghanistan. Uh, in that readout, it made clear that it hasn't it isn't that a decision has been made about the number of troops, but naturally we'd have to plan. Planning is not the same as a decision. So planning for different options is obviously what uh, what is taking place. Uh, but I don't have an exact day or week <clears throat> when things would change. It's just clear with all those factors that it's in the interest of both the United States and Afghanistan to have this signed as quickly as possible. I'm, I'm a little confused as to what happened here. Didn't Secretary Kerry work out this agreement with President Karzai? Why is he changing the conditions now? I would point you to President Karzai for that question. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, the content of the agreement was certainly agreed to when Secretary Kerry was there, and there were some final issues that were worked through, as you all recall last week. Uh, the uh, lawyer Jurga uh, strongly endorsed uh, and supported the <coughs> agreement in the process that was underway uh, this weekend, which is even more reason to move forward as quickly as possible. Was Secretary Kerry surprised by First, Karzai refusing to sign it, and then the, the additional conditions that he gave to Susan Rice? Uh, I, I, he hasn't characterized it to me in those terms. Obviously, uh, this is an issue that he is uh, committed to and, and feels as strongly as anyone else in the administration that we need to move forward as quickly as possible. Karzai has uh, intimated that uh, essentially he feels as if Afghan sovereignty has somehow been compromised by this entire negotiation, that uh, somehow his ability to lead his country without, you know, being perceived as being undercut in any way has been uh, created. Did the National Security Advisor address any of those concerns, and did Karzai indicate to her any other reason why he feels it's important to, for example, talk about bringing in the Pakistanis as part of trying to bring about peace in the country? Can you give us anything more on really what his concerns are? I can't. I would point you to him for that and point you uh, to the White House for any more specifics on, on Ambassador Rice's trip to Afghanistan. Was it anticipated that with the blessing of the lawyer Jirga that Karzai would still have these objections, or was there a sense in this building, once we can get past the meeting of the lawyer Jirga, that we should be able to get these documents signed so that we can go ahead and start looking for 2015? Well, certainly, Roz, if you look back to the Secretary's trip there that, that Cammy referenced, like just a few weeks ago, uh, there, they agreed on the, on the, uh, on the uh, in principle, in the text of the, of the BSA. They worked out some final issues last week. Certainly, we respect and, and did re have respected the political process in Afghanistan, but of course, we anticipated we would be signing uh, this soon after uh, the conclusion of the Loya Jirga. Can I ask you a really simple sure. question? Do you know? what Karzai really wants at this point? Uh, I don't have any, uh, uh, it is a simple question, but one I don't have any, uh, any insight to, to offer you on. I'm not, I'm not asking you if mm -hmm. you could tell us what he really wants. I'm only asking, does the State Department, does the Obama administration writ large know what Karzai wants? Uh, I just don't have any analysis on that for you, Brad. Yeah. Sure, on Afghanistan. Okay. Uh, why does the State Department need a signed bilateral security agreement now what? as opposed to now in April? Uh, well, I, I talked about this a little bit, but for a couple of reasons. Uh, uh, deferring uh, the signature of the agreement until uh, next year, after next year's election, would not provide the United States and NATO allies with the ability to plan for a post-2014 presence. That's of vital importance. It also puts at risk uh, the uh, pledges of NATO and other nations, uh, financial pledges uh, that were made uh, in Chicago at the Chicago and Tokyo conferences, and it also doesn't give the Afghan people, and this is a very important component, uh, the uh, certainty uh, that they need uh, as well on their end as they're also going into a, uh, an election season. Would it the administration also believes that as of January 1st, 2015, the U.S. has no legal right to be inside Afghanistan, and so any planning it would do absent the signing of the BSA is basically a waste of time and money. Well, that's uh, 
I, my math is not great right now, uh, 13 months away. Mm -hmm. uh, but planning is an important component. We need as much time as possible. Uh, so beyond that, that's why we're, we're focused on getting it done as quickly as possible now. But the fact, that, but you know, but to you know, kind of turn it around. Let's say things weren't signed until April or mm -hmm. May. There's, you know, there are a lot of things that need to be done that simply take up a lot of time. You get to December 31st. Not all of the planning has been done. But on January 1st, U.S. troops don't have the legal authority That's to be a lot in of, country. It's a lot of hypotheticals. Obviously, we've been clear that uh, waiting until after uh, the election is not a practical or viable option. So uh, that's the message we're conveying, and we are uh, continuing to press uh, to move forward on signing of the BSA. When was the last time Secretary Kerry spoke with Karzai? Uh, I believe he spoke with him. Uh, he spoke with him on Friday before we departed for uh, Geneva. Any plans to call him today or tomorrow? I don't have any prediction of that. If, if he speaks with him, I'm sure we can let all of you know. Um, is, is perhaps, in your opinion, is this just not a game of brinkmanship on the part of um, President Karzai? He knows you guys want a deal because so that you can plan, and he also wants to try and get some things out of you, so he's just holding off for the moment, but that he'll eventually sign it. Is that the feeling? Uh, I don't. I don't want to do political analysis on what his thinking is or what his motivation is. Uh, I think we've been very clear, and this is a message that Ambassador Rice sent when she was there that uh, we need to move forward as quickly as possible. There can't be any more delays uh, for the range of reasons that I outlined. Some of the things that his office suggested last night that he'd been asking Ambassador Rice for included um, some assurances on Afghan prisoners in Guantanamo and um, the United States being involved in the organization of the April 5th elections. Can you tell us if that's what your understanding is? He wants actually new things now that weren't on the table before? Uh, we've obviously seen his public comments. We have no reason to dispute that that's what he's looking for. But, uh, but uh, again, uh, this is something that uh, we've agreed to, we want to move forward on, and, and we want to sign as quickly so as possible. So are you not prepared to make any more concessions now? Uh, I don't want uh, this is, to. This is the negotiations have concluded. Uh, so we are uh, focused on uh, moving the signing forward so that we can plan as quickly as possible. So, so no more, nothing, nothing new from the American side. The, the deal is what it is. They either sign it or you walk away. You're not Obviously, we're to. working through how to get this done with the Afghans, but I don't have any specific commentary on the range of reports out there of what uh, President Karzai is, is are doing. You at least, are you examining? Have they been made to you? I, I'm assuming they must have been, because that must have been what was said in the meeting with Ambassador Rice yesterday. Are you examining the new requests from Karzai's office? I, I don't have anything for you on that. Please turn to the Afghanistan. Uh, uh, sure. Uh, Afghanistan. One more on Afghanistan. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, NSA Rice, in an interview to Toro TV, mm -hmm. again said about zero option. If there's no, no BSA, all the U.S. troops would pull out of Afghanistan. But do you think with the zero option, can you achieve your goal of keeping U.S. safe and your ultimate goal of three Ds, defeating the Al-Qaeda and Taliban without any troops in Afghanistan? I think what she also said, if I remember correctly, is that that wasn't our preference, um, that obviously we have to plan for different contingencies. It doesn't mean that a decision has been made. But we've long said that a BSA would be needed. Uh, in order to have a presence post-2014. On the planning, you get planning war within 24 hours or 48 hours. Why can't you do it in uh, planning of this, uh, planning post-2014, six months after April? It's not just the United States. It's our NATO allies. Uh, there are several complicated components of this, and so we need as much time as, as possible. The critics would say that uh, you're using Karzai's not signing this bilateral security agreement as an excuse to pull out, that Karzai is just a red herring. How would you respond? We've been very clear, and I just mentioned this, that's not our preference, uh, that there are interests for the United States, including preventing Afghanistan from becoming a safe haven for al-Qaeda, including the uh, importance of our security partnership. Uh, but uh, we need these requirements. Uh, the BSA uh, outlines them. It's long been negotiated. It's been a tough negotiation. Uh, and it's, uh, we've been very clear about our, our desire to sign it as quickly Is as possible. Is the administration serious about staying in Afghanistan post-2014 <coughs> with or without a signed bilateral security agreement? I, I would point you to what Ambassador Rice and, and the President have said about the need to have a BSA in order to have a presence, uh, but obviously we're planning uh, given the BSA isn't signed yet. Is the U.S. also taking the help of any of its allies and friends to convince Karzai to sign BSA ASAP? 
Uh, I don't have any specific readout of that. Uh, of course, uh, it's important. It's vitally important to our NATO allies uh, for this to be signed. In terms of what uh, case they're making, I would point you to them to them for more specifics. Sure. So the, um, the two U.S. military uh, aircraft have flown around these disputed islands in the East China Sea, defying China's declaration that, uh, that the region uh, falls into a new airspace defense zone. What, what is all this about, please? Uh, well, I know that the Department of Defense have, uh, has commented on that uh, specifically, which happened, I believe, just earlier today. Uh, there was also reports, which this is all related, so let me speak to these. Um, about uh, the November 23rd announcement that China has established an East China Sea Air Defense Identification Zone. Uh, this uh, unilateral action appears to be an attempt to unilaterally change the status quo in the East China Sea, uh, and thus will raise regional tensions and increase the risk of miscalculation, confrontation, and accidents. Uh, we have uh, made this case uh, to uh, uh, made this case to China. Assistant Secretary Russell raised U.S. concerns. Uh, with the ambassador uh, on November 23rd. Ambassador Locke also reiterated our concerns in Beijing, uh, <clears throat> and we have urged the Chinese to exercise caution and restraint. Uh, and we're also consulting with Japan and other affected parties uh, throughout the region uh, in response to uh, these, this announcement. So the U.S. has always said that this needs to be resolved diplomatically, mm -hmm. but isn't by flying around uh, <laughs> for the U.S. intervening this way, isn't that inflammatory and, and increasing tensions? Uh, well, um, we, you know, are continuing to encourage um, our partners. One, one thing, actually, let me let me say on this is that um, we don't uh, we uh, does not we don't support uh, efforts by any state to apply its uh, air defense identification zone procedures to foreign aircrafts uh, not intending to enter its national airspace. Uh, we don't apply. The United States does not apply. Uh, that procedure to foreign aircraft. So it certainly is one uh, we don't think others should apply. Uh, we've long talked about uh, concerns about increasing tensions or uh, the raising of tensions and the impact that would have. Um, at this point, our role is to continue to encourage both sides to uh, move forward um, with dialogue, um, to express uh, concerns when we disagree with steps that China has taken, which is, is a case we've obviously uh, done here, uh, but our position on the islands uh, that this uh, impacts, of course, has not changed. So that the U.S. recognizes that uh, Japan, for all intents and purposes, does have control of the Senkakus or Diaoyus. Is the U.S. concerned that by declaring this zone over the weekend that China is trying to drag Washington into this and Washington may have taken the bait? Uh, I don't think that there's been any bait taken. Uh, we've expressed our concerns, uh, and obviously we have a wide-ranging relationship with China, but uh, when there are concerns that need to be expressed, we are not shy about expressing them. I just uh, conveyed um, our view that uh, this uh, attempt, that, that we view this as an attempt to unilaterally change the status quo in the East China Sea. Uh, we've also uh, expressed our concerns directly to the Chinese as needed. So uh, you're familiar with our position uh, on the Senkakus. Um, it's longstanding. We don't take a position on the question of sovereignty. That hasn't changed. And we've long expressed concerns about efforts to raise tension. Uh, and, 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 and this is evidence of our, of our willingness to express that concern. Drop, uh, we're going back to yeah. Leslie's question, these flights were absolutely necessary. They, weren't, we, they shouldn't be viewed as a counter provocation. Uh, again, I don't have any specific comment on them. Uh, the Department of Defense has commented on them, and obviously uh, we'll look uh, more closely at actions as they continue. But does the U.S. consider this a, uh, a similar type of action to what uh, China has done in the past 18 months or so in, around the Scarborough Shoals? I don't want to compare it to any past incident. I think I just expressed what we've done, and obviously we'll continue to monitor day by day. Go ahead. Um, 20 countries in the world have ADI. Why can't China, including U.S. and Japan? Uh, well, I think I just conveyed that um, for the United States, we don't apply uh, the air defense identification zone procedures to foreign aircraft. So uh, I don't know the procedures or policies of other countries. Yeah. The concern here is what I just expressed, uh, which is about um, unilateral action on the part of China. Uh, that appears to be an attempt to unilaterally change the status quo. 
uh, in the East China Sea. I understand your concern, and actually after Secretary Kerry released the statement, mm -hmm. Chinese Foreign Ministry and Chinese Defense Ministry both said China's ADIZ is not aimed at any country and does not affect freedom of overflight. Mm -hmm. So what is your response to this? Uh, we've expressed our concerns when they need to be expressed, and uh, I've done those, and our statement uh, did those as well. And when you're talking about changing the status quo of the disputed <coughs> island, you know, months ago, Japan sent Coast Guard vessels to the island. Japan also released a video to claim the sovereignty of Senkaku or Diaoyu Island. Why didn't you express your concern back then? I don't have any historical analysis for you today. I can just tell you what we've done in this specific case. Joe? Right. To ask um, today, the Jap Japanese airlines have actually said that they're going to obey with these new um, rules set by Be Beijing, and they're going to start um, uh, notifying Beijing of their flight patterns. Is that uh, a good move? Or, uh, uh, do you see, do, would the United States see that as a good move? Or is it something that then mm -hmm. makes this a fait accompli at the end of the day? Um, I, I hadn't seen that before I came down here. I'm happy to, to speak with uh, Assistant Secretary Russell and others and see what our what our thoughts as a U.S. government are on that specific yeah, announcement. Whose decision was it to send the bombers? The what? Whose decision was it to send those bombers over there? Uh, again, I'd point you to DOD for any specifics on that. When it comes to ADIZ line with Japan, mm -hmm. which is overlapping the Chinese one, are you aware of who drew the Japanese ADIZ line? Who drew it? Yes, and who maintained it, who operated it? I don't have any specifics on that. Uh, are you aware of when you're conveying message that that line has been set by the United States and maintained by the United States and operated by the United States? I just wanted to clarify that. Uh, I don't have anything more for you. Do you have a question? Uh, no, I just wanted to clarify okay. that. Okay. Well, Syria, just to follow okay. up on uh, Go ahead. Uh, do you have a readout of the Secretary's phone call with Japanese Foreign Minister? And did they talk about this issue as well? Um, they did. I, I didn't get a lengthy readout. I will see if there's more we can provide to you. It was a call they had this morning. They spoke about this issue as well as um, the recent uh, agreement on, on Iran. <coughs> We'll go to you next, I promise. Yeah, sorry. From, uh, from your Chinese counterparts um, through diplomatic channels, otherwise, in response to this U.S. mission? Well, we've been in touch, as I mentioned. Uh, um, uh, Assistant Secretary Russell has been in touch. Ambassador Locke has been in touch to convey our concerns. I don't have any uh, readout for you of, of what they conveyed in response. If the uh, Chinese did not uh, rescind this uh, zone, what uh, options does the U.S. have? I'm not going to get into a hypothetical. Um, the Wall Street Journal published a report, I don't know if you're aware of it, but basically saying that the U.S. intelligence has already picked up signal that the attack on Gubuta, which is outside of Damascus, the chemical attacks, took place on the 18th of August, or they knew about it on the 18th of August, and the Obama administration covered it up because they were worried that that will cross the president red line. Can you respond to that? Do you see any... Um, Based into this accusation, and were you, when were you aware that the Assad regime actually were moving chemical weapons before the date itself of the attack? Which is I, I don't have anything on this for you. I, I can't imagine I will, uh, but I'm happy to circle back with our team and see if there's anything we can provide. Syria? Um, Zimbabwe. Zimbabwe, okay. Can, can we, are there any more on Syria? Okay. Um, the chairperson of the Kimberley process, the Kimberley process was meeting this week, suggested that the U.S. should consider removing sanctions on diamonds uh, in Zimbabwe. Uh, do you have a response to that? Do you think it's a good idea? Do you think that Zimbabwe is moving closer to uh, being acceptable in your eyes to remove sanctions? Is there any process in place in Washington that's looking at this issue? Uh, well, uh, Zimbabwe's adherence to the Kimberley Process Certification Scheme's minimum requirements remains a priority for uh, the United States. Uh, we remain concerned about uh, revenue transparency, treatment of artisanal miners, and the freedom of local communities and civil society organizations to operate peacefully in Zimbabwe's diamond mining areas. Uh, in terms of, and so we wish to see uh, increased transparency in revenue flows from diamonds. In terms of specific sanctions, as I'm betting you already know, uh, we have targeted sanctions on 113 individuals and 70 entities uh, found to have been undermining democracy in Zimbabwe. Uh, and we, of course, 
review sanctions uh, at all uh, times, but I don't have any prediction or update for you on, on anything or any expected change. And, but there is some travel by, I think, a, is it a Deputy Assistant Secretary, uh, I think next week, possibly. I don't want to announce it here. Yeah. But, um, are, are there, are there uh, mechanisms in place whereby you're looking at what's going on in country to make new assessments on that basis? Certainly, uh, as a part of any trip or visit, we take a look at a range of programs and a range of concerns. Um, I'm not aware of the trip. I'm happy to check with them and see if that's something that is uh, in process for next week. I've got an oddball question. Okay. Um, Cuba, uh, there's been a, there's a press release from the Cubans complaining about losing their bank account in the United States and that because of the U.S. economic sanctions, their embassy or their consulates and interest their UN mission and interest section in the United States cannot actually uh, conduct any financial business with anyone in the United States. Mm -hmm. and that, in their opinion, this is a violation of the Vienna Convention. Are you doing anything about this? Do you disagree with that? Uh, how might this be fixed? Let me check into the uh, accuracy of the report um, and see what's happening, and, and we can get an answer around to all of you. Great. Uh, to Africa and to sure. Central African Republic. Um, the French have announced today that they're going to send hundreds of extra troops to uh, Central African Republic. Um, and I know that some uh, State Department officials last week were warning that you're in a pre-genocidal situation mm -hmm. in, uh, in the country. Um, is it uh, a good thing that France is sending in more troops? And could you just update us on where you are, where the U.S. is on, on this situation? Sure. Um, I actually discussed this issue with our team before I came down here, but there's an internal discussion about it. So let me get back to all of you with, with an answer to, to some of your questions. On Ukraine? Mm -hmm. um, when you were last here before you left for Geneva, um, you uh, expressed disappointment that Ukraine had not signed uh, the EU pacts. Mm -hmm. um, you also mentioned that Secretary Kerry was not going uh, to the OSCE uh, summit. Mm -hmm. um, but you didn't really give a good explanation on why he wasn't going. Um, can you now be a little bit more clearer on why he decided not to go? Is that to do with the um, detention of Timoshenko, or has it got to do with um, the specific EU uh, issue? I cannot be any more clear than I was last <laughs> Friday, unfortunately, Leslie. Clear as mud. Okay. <laughs> protests that were on the streets in Kiev this weekend um, are angry at the fact that their authorities have decided not to go ahead at the moment with this association agreement with the EU. Sure. Um, we are uh, more than, as you know, more than 100,000 people uh, have taken to the streets in recent days to peacefully express their support for Ukraine's European integration. We are, of course, monitoring large protests um, in, in cities across the country. Uh, we continue to encourage all Ukrainians to, cont to express their views on Ukraine's future in a constructive manner. Uh, we support, of course, the aspirations of the Ukrainian people to achieve a prosperous European democracy. Uh, European integration is the surest course to economic growth uh, and strengthening uh, your Ukraine's democracy. And um, the, uh, the EU has actually said that the door still remains open. To the, and that they will be still prepared to sign this association agreement with Ukraine if the Ukrainian authorities can be persuaded. What are you trying to do on your part to, to, to urge them to go forward with the signing? Uh, we, we, of course, you're familiar with our long-standing position on this issue, which I semi-reiterated there. Um, I don't, I'd have to check and see if there are specific behind-the-scenes uh, actions or steps we're taking in the coming days uh, uh, to support that so effort. So Assistant Secretary Newland is going to be going to uh, Kiev for she the uh, OSCE meetings. Mm -hmm. Is she actually going to have meetings with the Ukrainian leadership while she's there as well? Uh, I'll have to check with her uh, and her team and see what, what her schedule looks like. Because I imagine visit. that would be a good opportunity for you to say, hey, guys, come on, <laughs> sign the agreement. I will pass that along. <laughs> <laughs> Scott? Any late reaction to the uh, ongoing protests in Thailand? Uh, I can give you a reaction. Uh, <clears throat> I don't know that it's late. Um, well, we'll take within the last uh, five hours. I don't have anything new. I'm sure mm -hmm. you saw, or hopefully you saw, the statement yes. we put out yesterday. I don't have any new reaction uh, beyond that to update you on. Okay. Uh, Scott, let's go to Scott next, and then we can go back to you. In Angola, mm -hmm. uh, there seem to be some conflicting reports about whether the government there has banned Islam. Mm -hmm. 
Is that a situation that you're watching, and what is your understanding about what's going on in Angola? Uh, well, Scott, I'm also going to have to take that one and talk to our Africa team about our uh, specific reaction on that front. Sure. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, there seems to be a, a subject closure of prep schools in Turkey. Do you have any reaction to that? I, I would point you to the Turkish government for any specific reaction on that or details. Uh, Japan? Japan? Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, yes. As you know, no, secrecy law has passed today by the uh, lower house of parliament. Uh, do you have some comment toward this? Um, I, I actually hadn't seen those reports before I came down here, so I'll check with our team and see if there's uh, more. Uh, mm -hmm. um, but, you know, what, what, what do you think? Yeah, do, don't you have some implication about what kind of impact it had throughout the bilateral relation, relationship between Japan and the U.S.? Yeah. To, to to which piece? To you know, security law, and the coming uh, NSC new NSC law. Bill, uh, bill. Yeah. I, I don't have any particular analysis on it for you at this point. Go ahead. Yeah, last week uh, Pakistan charged uh, Dr. Afridi with murder charges. Mm -hmm. uh, has the U.S. Uh, spoken to Pakistanis <laughs> on this issue? Um, uh, I, I, we're, we're obviously, of course, in close contact on the ground. I'd have to check and see if there's anything recently in the past couple of days on this specifically. Uh, we are, of course, concerned about the new charge uh, brought uh, late last week against Dr. Afridi, the Pakistani doctor who aided in the intelligence gathering effort that made possible the killing of the world's most wanted terrorist, Osama bin Laden. His assistance in confirming the location of bin Laden was a service to the entire world and to Pakistanis who had lost loved ones and suffered at the hands of al-Qaeda. Uh, we called on proper authorities to ensure that Dr. Afridi receives a fair trial uh, for this new charge. For someone who plays such a critical role in uh, eliminating one of the top uh, terrorist leaders of the world, why isn't U.S. seen helping this guy to come out of prison? Well, we've, we've long uh, expressed our belief that his treatment is both unjust and unwarranted. Uh, we uh, regret, regret, of course, that he was convicted and the severity of his sentence. Uh, we've expressed that in the past before as well, um, and we've conveyed that uh, very clearly to the Pakistani government. What do you think about the charges leveled against Dr. Afridi? Uh, alleged, reportedly, he's uh, facing murder charges because a patient died of appendicitis. Mm -hmm. uh, well, again, uh, we believe his treatment is unjust and unwarranted. Uh, that continues to apply. We have expressed that clearly uh, to the Pakistani government, um, and we've uh, expressed our desire for him to receive a fair trial. Okay. Do you dispute the notion that Pakistan uh, believes that he has terror ties? Uh, I think we, we've we expressed, again, uh, our concerns about his treatment, uh, so I don't know that I have much more for you all on it. Do you think those charges are baseless? I, I don't have much more for you on it. But are you satisfied with the response you're receiving from Pakistan on this particular issue? Uh, well, again, uh, we've continued to raise this issue at the highest levels. Uh, we're concerned about his health and well-being. Uh, we've encouraged uh, the Pakistani government to protect him and his family. Obviously, uh, he's not only remains in jail, but he's been charged with a new crime. So I will let you answer that question uh, for yourself. Has there been any talk about uh, maybe withholding some of the money that was recently released based on the Prime Minister's visit here? Sure. I don't have any prediction of that for you, uh, Lucas. I have one more on Pakistan. Okay. Uh, Pakistan today released three Taliban prisoners who would be talking with Afghanistan, part of the Afghanistan Pakistan, uh, Taliban talks. Do you have anything to say on that? I don't have anything specifically on that. Thanks, everyone. Thank